So I'll say again, welcome. We're glad you're here. If you're a visitor, a newcomer, you know, jumping in here in January, we are so glad you're here. And, and, and I get a chance today to set up this new sermon series, uh, or, or sort of a new sermon series. And I say sort of because uh, we're going to be in, in the winter and the spring looking at the gospel of Luke. And I say sort of because if you were here Christmas and Advent around that season, we have been in Luke for this kind of whole time, especially the first two chapters. And we looked at the birth narratives and we looked at Mary and Zechariah and we looked at uh, uh, Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna and all these stories. And so uh, what we wanna do is really dive into the whole gospel of Luke. And so now I'm going back to the beginning in the first four verses and this uh, introduction that Luke writes to his uh, friend named in verse three, Theophilus. And the great thing about uh, Luke is that, that it is uh, the third book of the New Testament, right? So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's what's known as one of the four gospels. Luke is the longest of the four gospels, and it's only volume one. Actually, he writes volume two, which is the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. And Luke writes more content in the New Testament than any other author. Almost, over 25% of the New Testament was written by Luke. And so he's an argument for uh, long-winded preachers everywhere. That's what Luke is. But what he does is he shows us not just what have you experienced in religion, not just uh, uh, what kinds of people have you encountered that call themselves Christians, but he gives you Christ. And we get this chance in the gospel to walk through the accurate, real picture of who was Jesus. What did he say? What did he do? Why does it matter 2,000 years later today? Let me pray for us. I want to pray over us. Luke is the gospel of love. Love is emphasized in Luke more than any other gospel. And uh, so I just want to pray uh, over us that we would experience in this series the love of God. Let's pray. Jesus, you have called us as a church. to be about seeing people, seeing our city awakened to and transformed by the love of Jesus. So Lord, as we enjoy your grace, as we dwell in your uh, 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 word, as we go through the gospel of, of Luke, I pray not that just we would just have some moral duty to go out and, and do better and live better, but that we would experience and feel and know the love the never stopping, never giving up, unfailing, steadfast love of Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend the winter and spring in the first half of Luke, and uh, we'll come to the summer, and we'll do a fun series called Questions, and we'll get a chance to really say, uh, let you, your neighbors, your friends drive that series this summer. We'll focus then on kind of embodying love, a part of our, our mission statement. And, and it'll be a time, hey, what are the big questions about faith? Like, what, who is this Jesus? And what about suffering and evil? And all the questions you ask, the questions that your friends and neighbors, non-Christians ask, uh, we'll spend the summer doing that. And then in the fall, we'll come back and really focus on engaging culture and, and focus on Jesus sending his disciples out in the second half of Luke's gospel. So... Uh, as we jump into Luke, here's what I want us to see. I want us to see who Luke is, who he's writing to, and why it matters. I want us to see these things, and, and here's, here's why it's important. There used to be a, a bumper sticker I'd see a lot. I don't know if I've seen it that much recently, but uh, it's, a, it's a prayer, uh, and it's a non-Christian bumper sticker, but it's a prayer, and it says, Lord, please save me from your followers. Lord, please save me from your followers. And uh, the reason that's important is because, you know, today, Christians, we kind of get uh, a bad rap. Uh, we kind of have the reputation as people who will be, uh, you know, angry and uh, boycotting and, and judgmental. The, 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 we, we're the people who refuse to, to bake cakes, and we like to boycott things, and we like to, you know, judge people. And that's sort of the reputation that, that Christians have. And what Luke does is we get into Luke and say, hey, maybe you got burned by Christianity. Maybe you got burned by the church. Maybe you've been wounded by harsh people or religious people or judgmental people. Uh, uh, that, that's part of my story. But it, it, and if that's you, it says, let, let the gospel of Luke sink in because you'll see not just Christians, you will see Christ. 
you will have the opportunity to let Jesus rescue the gospel from any past painful experiences you might have had. We have the chance to let Jesus and the Gospel of Luke rescue us from the perception of Christianity sometimes developed by the practice of Christians. And so that's the great thing about Luke. And if, 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 you, know any, if you know about Luke, uh, Luke was a skeptic. Luke was a skeptic. And, and this is one of the things I love because by, by nature, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I, 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 I am naturally argumentative. I love a good argument. I try to oppose, you know, uh, uh, everything I don't like, establish rules. I want to undermine those. I want to get a, around them. Uh, if, if, if you try to tell me something, even if I agree with you, I'm going to argue with you because I just like to argue. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a skeptic. I'm going to pretend I don't believe you. Like that's just my nature. I've tried to overcome some of, uh, of that in my life. And, but, but that's just kind of who I am. Like if there's anything trendy or everybody's on a bandwagon over here, I'm just, I'm skeptical. I'm like, nope, I'm not even going to get on board with that. And you know, like uh, uh, smartphones came out in 2007. I just waited like four years to get a, get a smartphone. I'm like, nah, we'll see. And, and you might say, well, that doesn't mean you're a skeptic. That means you're just an idiot. Like, I don't know if that's the same thing. And maybe I can't argue with you on that. But either way, I'm just saying this is by nature uh, who I am. And this is by nature who Luke is. And so the cool thing about Luke is, he says, what are you, a skeptic, a doubter? You don't buy into this Jesus stuff? You don't buy into this Christianity uh, 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 junk. You, you don't like people making claims and saying, here are the rules, here's this. Uh, you're skeptical about uh, uh, Christians and skeptical about church and skeptical about all these kinds of stuff. Guess what? Luke is right there with you. And he's saying, you're welcome here. You're welcome to this gospel. You're welcome to, to investigate who Jesus is. And I would say you're welcome in this church. It means skeptics, welcome. Sufferers, welcome. That's the beautiful thing about Luke. Some of you have experienced that before. I, I, I know that for me, like, some of the hardest things for me to get by in my own faith have been seeing heroes of mine, people I thought were really committed to Christ and following him, turn out not just to be, you know, fallen and sinful and human like all of us, but to turn out to be liars and hypocrites and you know, when I first got into ministry, the man, I was just, just getting into ministry. I hadn't actually had a job yet, but I was trying to get into ministry. And, 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 and the man that I looked up to, the man that I consider my mentor, uh, the man that I consider my mentor in ministry and as a friend and a, and a Christian, he, he did uh, something uh, unspeakably evil. And it so, it, it so hurt me, so damaged my faith. It almost just kind of like dropped out like, man, I, I, I can't. I can't, be a, I can't be a pastor in this deal. Because of what I saw. So maybe some of you have seen stuff like that. You've experienced stuff like that. And you're skeptical. Some of you are not Christians. You, 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 you know you don't believe in Jesus yet and you're skeptical. Some of you are Christians and, and you're naturally doubting and, and skeptical. And what do we, what do we see here? Uh, look, look at this uh, introduction that Luke writes. I'm just going to read it all again, uh, these four verses. He says this, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished upon us. In other words, a lot of people have tried to write the story of Jesus. We've got Matthew, Mark, and John. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you might have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, notice, he, who, is the, who, is, who is he writing Luke to? He's writing Luke to this guy named the most excellent Theophilus. Now, some people, there's some debate about who is Theophilus, right? The only other time we see him mentioned is in the beginning of volume 2, and it's in you know, Luke's volume 2, Acts chapter 1, and, and, and we don't know anything else about him, really. Uh, but, and so some people have said, you know what? Theophilus means like beloved of God or, or lover of God. And so maybe it's just, just like a, you know, a fake name that Luke's given them and, and just kind of saying, this is written to all people who love God or all people who are beloved of God. But I, I, I don't think that can be true because he calls him most excellent Theophilus, which, which, which if you look at it, there's only four times in the Bible anyone is called most excellent anything, and Luke does them all, and the other three are all in the book of Acts, and every time he's referring to a high-ranking Roman official. 
And so most likely, Theophilus is a high-ranking Roman official. He's educated and he's skeptical, but he's been, he's been hearing about this. So he says that you would have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So probably Luke has been, you know, sharing the gospel with this dude, Theophilus, who's an educated, wealthy Roman governor or ruler. And Theophilus is like, I'm, I'm, I'm picking up what you're laying down. I'm smelling what you're stepping in, Luke, but I don't know if I can be certain these things happen. I'm an educated cat and... I don't know if I can buy into all this faith and Jesus and cross and all that kind of stuff, right? It's a very relevant question. It's the same question any, a lot of people, you know, ask today. Like, oh, you want to tell me about Jesus? How do you know that's true? How do you know these things aren't just made up? How do you know they're not just legends? How can I be, verse 4, certain? And so Luke writes this gospel saying, I want you to be certain. I want you to investigate. Luke is a skeptical, and he's starting with the skeptical objections. What objections do you have, your friends have? What things do you really wrestle with and go, man, God, I believe in you, but if you're real, how can this happen? How can things look like this? How can my life go like this? How can there be this much pain? What are the things that, you, that, that you're skeptical about that, that make you think, how can I be certain? That's what the whole gospel of Luke is. And Luke is a skeptic. A skeptic. And so let me just tell you a little bit more about Luke because you, you're going to get a flavor for how he's going to present Jesus here. He's writing to a guy he's been sharing the gospel with. He's writing as an educated man to an ed- another educated uh, person. And uh, uh, one thing we know about Luke is he's a Gentile. Uh, Luke is the only Gentile author in the New Testament. Every other one is Jewish, but Luke is a Gentile uh, because we know that because his name is, is a Greek name. He's a Gentile, and this gospel is a gospel for the Gentiles. You read Matthew, it's like gospel for the Jews, like Old Testament quotes everywhere in Matthew. Luke is not the same. Mark, he's, a, uh, he's writing to the, the Greeks. He's a storyteller. It's short. It's fast-paced. Uh, he's for the storytelling Greeks. John, John is for like the philosophers among us in, in, in the world. Uh, but Luke is, is this gospel of love for the Gentiles, salvation for the whole world. The prominent theme in Luke is that salvation, Jesus came for all people. And in fact, the theme verse of Luke is probably Luke 19.10, when Jesus finishes up with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the guy that no one thought could ever get close to God or ever have anything to do with God or God would have anything to do with him. And, and Jesus says, you're saved. Salvation has come to your house. And in fact, the Son of Man, Jesus, he says, the Son of Man has come. The reason I've come, the reason for uh, what we uh, celebrated at Christmas, the reason for the incarnation, the reason for the sacrifice of Jesus, the reason I came, he says, was to seek and to save the lost. Anyone who's a doubter, a skeptic, anyone who feels they're far from God, anyone who, 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 who has wandered, anyone who wonders, anyone who doubts, anyone who has had to wrestle with these ideas, anyone who wonders if God could really love someone like you, Jesus says the Son of Man came to seek and to save you. That's the, the dominant message all the way through Luke, uh, 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 that salvation is for the whole world. In fact, when he does the genealogy at the end of chapter 3, there's two genealogies of Jesus, one at the beginning of Matthew, Matthew 1, and then one at the end of Luke 3, right? So Luke, you know, they go on Ancestry.com, and they get the genealogy report. And in Matthew, it traces Jesus' lineage back to David, King David, the, the, the greatest king of Israel. But you'll see later that Luke traces the genealogy back to Adam, Adam and Eve, the, the very first human being. Not the, the great Israelite, but the first human being. In other words, saying salvation is for all, all people. That's the beauty of what uh, Luke is doing. So he's a Gentile, and this is his message. And so all the way through Luke, uh, uh, there's all this unique content, and you're going to see him uh, uh, dealing with rich and poor, and, and you've got uh, uh, Jesus being washed by a prostitute, and you've got a wealthy father with a, with a good son and a rebellious teenage son, and, and how, does, how does that all happen and relate to the gospel? You've got widows and orphans, and you've got sick and healthy. You've got single and married. You've got all these kinds of people everywhere. You've got young and old, right? Uh, Mary was probably 14, 15, 16 years old when she uh, had Jesus. And, and you have Simeon later in chapter 2. He's uh, got to be, you know, and Anna, they've got to be in their 80s, 90s, maybe even over 100. And Luke is emphasizing again and again, I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care if you're, uh, what's your nationality, your geography, your background, your parentage, your race, your, your, your belief system, your skeptical. I don't care who you've been, what you've done. The Son of Man came 
to seek and to save the lost. So that's, that's why it's important to see what Luke is doing. Luke's also a doctor. Luke's a physician. Colossians 4 calls him the beloved doctor, the beloved uh, uh, physician, and, and, and which means uh, uh, he, he's educated. And you see this in the first sentence. Like, look at the first word, inasmuch. Now, I've got some degrees, some letters behind my name. I don't remember the last time. I don't think I've ever written or said inasmuch. I don't even know what it means. I had to look it up. It just means since. Like, in other words, since other people have done this, now I'm going to do I'm going to do that. And, 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 and she would go like, that's kind of pretentious. Like, we got to start this book with these letters. But here, here's, here's the deal. Luke is writing a formal introduction to a Gentile world that's used to formal introductions. It would be like watching a TV show in the 80s, and there would always be a theme song, right? Like, that's just how it goes. There's always an introduction. And this is the introduction. And those four verses are... One sentence in Greek, one sentence in the original language, and if you, stu- people have studied it, say like this, this, this one sentence is the literary, vocabulary, whatever, it, 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 style, it is the greatest Greek sentence written in the entire New Testament and one of the best in all the Greek writing world, on the same par with like Homer and Thucydides and Herodotus and other people you don't really care about. But what it says is, is, is Luke has taken this seriously. He is, uh, he, is, he is rolling this out, and he has this introduction. Why? Because in that, in that day, right, uh, uh, Luke, you didn't go to a bookstore to buy Luke. Luke's not in a book. The Bible's not in a book. It's in a scroll. So, so how do you open, like, in other words, you, you don't go to Amazon and click look inside and see what's all in there, right? You don't go to a bookstore and open it up and leave through it. You have a scroll, so you open the scroll. You can't go to chapter 22 because you've got to, like, roll that thing all the way back there. But you open it up, and you can see that first sentence. He says, I want you to see what this is all about. And so we know Luke has this amazing uh, uh, introduction. He's very smart, and he is a doctor, which is interesting because it means he's a scientist. Uh, uh, he's a, a scientist, and when you're a doctor, you're like a, um, a, a detective of the human body um, because you have to ask people questions that seemingly make no sense. Like, I went to the doctor a few months ago, and like, sir, why are you here today? Why did you come to the doctor? Uh, I, I think I have the flu, I'm sick, I feel terrible. Can I get a prescription and, you know, some medicine? Uh, yes, sir, we'd love to see you in just a moment. If you take these 19 pages of forms and fill them all out, then we'll see you after a while. And then you go in, the doctor, you know, asks you, like, did your mom have ingrown toenails? And so on. you're like, can you just write me a prescription and get me out of here? But see, a doctor is an investigator. A doctor is trying to make sure they're not missing anything. A doctor is turning over every stone. A doctor is saying, no, 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 it might look like this. It might present like this, but i got to make sure it's not X, Y, or Z. It's not in your family history. It's not all these other things because I care about that. That's what Luke does. Luke goes under, overturns every stone. You see it there uh, in, in, verse, in, in verse 2. He says he's going to examine the eyewitnesses. Verse 3 says, I've followed these things for some time now. He's a doctor, he's a detective, he's an investigative reporter, journalist, researcher, whatever you want to call it, and that makes him a great historian. Luke is the greatest historian uh, in the New Testament. He refers to more times and dates and places and people and, and titles and all that kind of stuff. And you're like, well, who really cares about that? Well, if you're a skeptic, you want to know, can I really rely on anything that's being said? Is this true or is this just legend? Like, you know, you start talking about Jesus and people are like, ah, I mean, I get you, man, but well, you know what happened with Jesus, right? Like it's, uh, they kind of tell you it's like a game of telephone. You ever play telephone? You're like second grade and, you know, the teacher starts over here and whispers to one student, you know, I don't know, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, right? And then by the time it gets down the other end, it's like, what, so what does she say? And, and it's uh, uh, Peter bought a out, Subaru Outback somewhere. You know what I mean? It's just like some random statement it has nothing to do with anything else that was said. You say, see, that's what happened with the Gospels, with the Bible. There were some stories, and they got told and told and told, and eventually you got all these crazy legends that were happening. But no, Luke is a doctor investigating, overturning every stone. He's an historian, and, and for a while people thought like, oh, he got all his names and dates and facts wrong. But now, last 100 years, we've found out a lot more about the Roman world and uncovered inscriptions and all that kind of stuff. And, and this is what one scholar said, uh, because this is the unanimous sort of decision now about Luke's his, history. Whenever any modern scholarship has been able to check on the accuracy of Luke's work, the judgment has been unanimous. He is one of the finest and ablest historians in the ancient world. Just as a historian, 
See, one of my big objections about Christianity was like blind leap of faith, leap of faith in the dark. Check your mind at the door. You've got to check your mind at the door if you're going to become a Christian. And Luke is saying, no, you don't. Because Luke himself was a skeptic. And, and he's giving us this to say, like, you can believe. See, he was a historian before there was, you know, uh, 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 fake news. And, 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 and he reported these things accurately. And the, the crazy thing, here's why this is important. Uh, if you look at verse 1, he says, I'm compiling a narrative, a story. It's a history because it's, it's a story. Now, why is that important? Because this is why Christianity is so much different than every other religion. Every other religion is not a story. It's a teaching. It's a path. It's a way. Christianity is a story. That's why it's called the gospel. It means good news. It means there's a story that's true. Something has happened. Someone named Jesus has come and sought and saved the lost. Something has happened. And it's not just good advice about how to get back in church, get your life straight, or be a good person. It is good news that Jesus has come and anyone who believes in him becomes part of that family, can be saved, can be rescued. It's a story to be believed. And this is, this is where a lot of us have gotten in trouble. Listen, how many of, of you, how many of your friends or family, uh, how many neighbors have you heard say, you know what, I, I tried Christianity. It just didn't work for me. You know, I grew up with it or I tried it later on, like I tried to obey it. I tried to, I tried to follow Jesus' teaching. I tried to understand and make him my example. I tried to pray the Lord's Prayer and, and obey the Sermon on the Mount. And I tried, I tried, it just didn't work for me. You know why? You know why it didn't work? Christianity is a story, a true story to be believed, not just some teaching to be followed. And so if you make Jesus your teacher before you make him your savior, then the gospel, then, the, then, the, then it will crush you. See, every other religion is like, here, you know, here's the eightfold path to enlightenment. Here's the, here's the five pillars of obedience to God and what it means to obey God and walk with God. And it doesn't really matter if they're historically true or not. It's just that it's, it's, it, the teaching is true. The teaching works no matter whether it happened in history or not. But Christianity is different. It's a story that all of our other stories point to, right? This is how C.S. Lewis was converted. I just watched the new Beauty and the Beast with my, with my six-year-old daughter. And uh, it's a great story. And every time you see one of these stories, you have to be reminded that it is a beautiful but yet dim reflection of the gospel story. Because in our heart of hearts, we know, the reason we love these stories in our heart of hearts, we know it points to something that is true. Namely, that there is a curse in the world. That there's, there's something wrong that makes us beastly. but that there's one beauty who can come and save the beast. That's the story of Christianity. Not that you're a beast and if you go by this step-by-step process and do this and this, then you will find in obedience, some may, someday Jesus will say, okay, I think I'll let you in. You find Jesus, the true beauty who came to seek and save the beast like me and you. It's amazing. That's why it's important that Luke is an historian because if Christianity is not, not real, if it's not accurate, then, as Paul said, we are of most people to be pitied. It's a beautiful story to which all the other stories point. And, and lastly, Luke is a skeptic. Luke is a skeptic. I, I, I love this. You know he's a skeptic because he goes down and it says, I've, he interviews the, the, the witnesses and, and all this stuff. See, this is so different because the modern story, if you talk to anybody, like the modern story is, well, you know how ancient people were. They were superstitious. They, you know, they called it demon possession. It was just mental illness. They, they said this. It was just a, a fluke or whatever. And, you know, ancient people are just uh, superstitious. They believe anything. They're naive. They didn't have science like us. So these miracles they ascribe and do kind of things. And so that's why you believe in things like, you know, the virgin birth, like, um, which should never pass now, right? And, and, and you go, really, is that? I mean, it takes like a, a third grader could defeat that argument because... When you go look at it, it's not like, okay, Joseph and Mary, like Joseph might not have known uh, um, all the different, he might not have gone through like seventh grade sex ed class with us, but he knew enough to know when Mary was like, hey, uh, fiance, I am pregnant and I know we haven't ever slept together, but you got to understand 
It's a miracle. It's a virgin birth. He wasn't like, oh, whew, thank goodness. Well, I just thought, yeah, virgin birth, that's right. I, just another great explanation. No, he was like, all right, how do I put this woman away? Because she's cheated on me. Because that story ain't never holding up with anybody, right? That's not going to hold up. Because he knew enough to know that that would be crazy. And there was nobody that's ever going to believe that story unless God himself sends his angel and says, let me tell you something, it actually happened, it's true. There's no reason to put it in there unless it's true. See, Luke is a skeptic. He's gone and interviewed these people and, 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 and figured this out. And he says, I want you to have certainty. He does it with careful investigation. It says in verse 3, he followed all these things closely for some time. He does it with accuracy. He checks with the eyewitnesses. And here's the great thing is that the gospels, a lot of people, you know, the telephone game, right? Well, eventually over 100 years, it finally got to be this story about Jesus. And he was a miraculous supernatural being. No, the gospels are written way too early. The Bible's written way too early to be fabricated. Luke is writing like 25 years after Jesus died. You can't just make junk up. It's like... You know, 200 years after he died, you can kind of say, whatever, there's nobody around to contradict you. He says, I'm talking to the eyewitnesses. These are, this is eyewitness testimony. Just like, you know, if 25 years ago for us is 1993, right? That was the year of the 500-year flood in St. Louis, a big flood. And if I said to you, you know what, 25 years ago, I was down by the arch and I saw a dude standing there and he held his arms out and the water was coming toward the arch and he held it back in a wall of miraculous water. He held it back for, for four days until the water all receded. You'd be like, uh, probably people in this room can dispute, like, you'd be like, bro, get off whatever you're on and like join reality here. Because there's plenty of eyewitnesses, plenty of people who are on duty, police officers or whatever, that can contradict that story from 25 years ago. And he's saying, no, no, this is eyewitness testimony. It can be examined and verified. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. And, and you see that, you'll see, we'll see this next week in the, the, the great little story where, you know, Jesus is, is lost in the temple. Uh, uh, um, Jesus goes missing. They come back from the Passover feast and they are missing Jesus. They cannot find him for three days. I lost my middle son once for like 15 minutes, almost had a heart attack. This is three days. Three days they were without him. And here, here's, why that's, here's why that's interesting. It's because he, he probably interviewed Mary for that deal, right? Like if you look at Luke 2.51, what it says is um, uh, his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. How, how, can, how can he know that unless he talked to her or, or those, those around her? And see, what that tells you too is that the Bible it's too early to be fabricated, but as Tim Keller says, it's also just simply uh, too counterproductive to be fake, right? He interviews Mary and she tells him the story. Like, if you interview my mom and say, what was Jeremy like? What was he like as a kid, as a child, or whatever? You know, like, my mom thinks I could do no wrong. Like, you could get me on video mugging someone and beating him up, and she'd be like, he's the sweetest. He's just, something must have happened, you know. It's, it's not his fault. If you interview my mom, she's going to tell you all the great stories about me. And she'll say, you know, Jeremy was just the best baby ever. She's a southern mom. And so that's, I, just, I do a good, you know, Angie. That's how she talks. And so she, she, would, she would probably say like, things like, he's the best baby. You know, my wife would be rolling her eyes in the background. She's like, every time I ask her mom, she's got nothing. So my mom's not going to tell you the, you know, the times I almost gave her a heart attack. She's not going to tell you about when I snuck out in the middle of the night and was, couldn't be found for hours and hours. She's not going to tell you about when I struck out in the bottom of the ninth of the championship game in baseball. Like, she's not going to tell you those stories because those aren't great stories. But when, it, why? Because it's like counterproductive to her, her, her narrative of her, her boy, right? Her, her son. And, and, and you got to imagine Mary had all kinds of stories like that about Jesus, right? I mean, he's Jesus. And she was probably, you know, she probably told all kinds of stories like, man, one time Joseph was teaching carpentry and hit his thumb with a hammer and it was all bleeding. And Jesus just healed it. And Jesus went to little Hebrew school and all the kids that felt like outcasts, Jesus befriended them. There's probably all kinds of stories like that. This is the only one we have from his childhood when he's 12 years old. And it is the story that is simply the most terrifying and puts Jesus, Mary and even Jesus himself in the worst light. In other words, you don't include a story like this unless it actually happened. He's putting it in there to prove to us to overcome our skepticism. Like You see that happen. You're like, my gosh, they lost a kid for three days. Called Department of Family Services on these people, right? It's, it's kind of crazy. There was no Amber Alert. All of Jerusalem didn't get a text message that day. And imagine, like, you know, Mary, instead of being known as Mary the Blessed Virgin, Mary the God-bearer, she was known as, like, Mary the God-loser. You, know, you know, just like reading the story of God had this wonderful plan of salvation where he sent his son Jesus to die for the sins of all mankind. 
but his parents lost him when he was 12. Like it's all, all downhill. We had a good run. It's only in there if it's true. And you see this all through the Gospels. In fact, you get to the end of Luke. What do you see in, verse 9, in Luke 19? You see Jesus ready to go to the cross, right? He's our Savior. He's going to redeem us on the cross. This is the plan. It's the mission. He should be like, I, you expect him to be like, you know, George Watch across the Delaware. He's like, you know, standing up and like pointing. Here we go. I'm taking off. Instead, what do you see? You see Jesus. You see Jesus struggling. You see him on his knees praying. You see him sweating drops of blood, begging God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Let it pass. Nevertheless, your will be done. And Jesus goes to the cross. He does that so that you and I might be certain. Our skepticism would be overcome. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, the skeptics, the sufferers, the, those in pain, those doubting, those worried, those frustrated, those who have been beaten up, abused, rich and poor, every nation. He came to see people awakened to and transformed by the love of, of Jesus. That's why he came even to go to the cross. And we don't know what happened with Theophilus. We don't know what happened with his faith, but we do know what happened with Luke. That the greatest skeptic became the great man of faith. Because at the end of his life, at the end of Paul's life, he became a companion, traveling companion with Paul. And at the end of Paul's life, Paul had a faithful end to his ministry, but not an easy one. He said every single person has a deserted me. When it got painful, when persecution came, everyone abandoned me. Everyone deserted me except Luke. Except Luke. The skeptic had become this man of strength and faith who even when death was at his doorstep, he did not run. That's the kind of zeal and strength and passion. That's the kind of transformation that happened because he met the real Jesus. The skeptic was convinced. And you can be too. I know it's easy a lot of times to sit out and kind of think, oh, the, you know, it's easy for these people to believe. It's easy for a pastor to believe. Let me tell you, it's never been easy for me to believe. I'm a skeptic by nature. And I've had periods uh, in my life where I've had to just go back to the, every single foundation I could imagine, ask every other question, investigate every other religion and worldview and uh, uh, atheism and agnosticism and everything else. And, and, and every time I do it, I come away more convinced by intellectual arguments of Christianity and more convinced by the logical proofs and the scientific evidence and the historical record of people that gave their lives to verify the truth of seeing Jesus risen from the dead. But ultimately and in the end, God does not give us an argument. In the end, he doesn't give us a proof. In the end, he gives us a person. He gives us this man, this God-man, Jesus, his own son who came to seek and save lost people like you and me. We don't know if the Theophilus converted. We don't know what happened to him, but we know that Luke did. We know he was a skeptic at heart, and now he's giving us this gospel and saying, I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've been, whatever's happened, that, 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 that to follow Jesus, to be a part of him is to create a church where, what are you, a skeptic? You're welcome. What are you, a doubter? Come on in and wrestle with those doubts here. What are you, rich, poor, blind, hurting, whatever it is, come on in and meet Jesus who came to seek and save the lost. The one who wrestled in Gethsemane, the one who sweated drops of blood. Is the one who paid for my sin and your sin. And Luke says, I have written this carefully, historically, accurately, that you might have certainty, that you would know the truth concerning these things you have been taught. Do you have that? I just want you to reflect on that as we close. Just a couple of, a couple of questions to, to reflect on. A couple of things to think about. We all doubt. What do you do with your doubt? What am I doing with them? It's, it's sexy to be a skeptic today. Like, I'm a skeptic. I don't believe anything. But Luke was not a lazy or just sexy skeptic. He actually went out and found out what 
is this true or not? What are you doing with your doubts? Are you wrestling with them? Are you finding out they're true? Are you bringing them to God? Are you, are you going to Scripture? Are you going to people that know? Like, what are you doing? Don't just sit on them. Do something with them. Next one. What, what one step of faith can I take this week? I'm not asking you to keep some grand New Year's resolution to be some, like, you know, SEAL Team 6 Christian or whatever. Like, what's one small step of faith? Maybe just set aside 10 minutes in the morning to pray and read a little Scripture. Start reading through Luke. Get, get ahead. Go serve someone who is, is, is in need. What, what is it? And I'm not going to do the last one, but the third one is, 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 do I have a relationship with God or do I have a bargain with God? Christianity, ultimately, is not a teaching to be followed. Jesus is not an example to be obeyed. He's a Savior who rescues. And if you believe that story, most of us don't have a relationship with God. We have the teaching of God. We have a bargain with God. I'll do this if you do this. Do you have a relationship with God or do you just have a bargain? You've bargained with him for this or that or the other. Like if you do this and I'll get my, whatever it is you're bargaining with God for, that's your real God. You're worshiping something, someone. You're following somewhere. What is your true God or God's? Have you not just taken Jesus as a, a nice, good teacher, but as a savior? Not just a teaching to be followed, but a savior to be believed, to be loved, to be known. Wherever you are, Jesus is saying, I came to seek and save you. My arms are open. Come. Let's pray. Jesus, you are good. You came to seek and save the lost. You came to convince skeptics. You came to serve the poor and love the rich. You came to heal the hurting. You came that you would bring salvation to anyone who feels far from God. Lord, let us not, those of us who are Christians, let us not feel superior. Let no one say about us, Lord, rescue us from your followers. Let them say these are people who enjoy the grace of God because they've experienced undeserved love, unfailing, steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen.